um, I, I just have a, uh, to start, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how the film was commissioned uh, by the BNA, um, and if they gave you special instruction or if it was just like a free form. Well, the, uh, the Biennale, which uh, organizes the Venice Film Festival, has this really wonderful uh, program for, for filmmakers who are working on their first and second features. And you apply with a producer, and there's a workshop. And at the end of the workshop, the 12 projects that are workshopped, uh, four are selected and given 150,000 euros. And the idea is that you're, you're really making a micro-budget film. So you're not permitted to raise funds uh, beyond the 150,000 euros. But you, you, know, you get notified in December, and you have to turn in a rough cut the first week of June. And we shot this um, in May of 2021. And I had to edit very quickly. Um, and then it premieres at the, it premiered at the Venice Film Festival. Okay, so you can't raise additional funds? No, well, they made an exception this year because of COVID and because of the, the pandemic's um, mm -hmm. testing costs. They allowed us to raise, I think it was 10 to 15% of that okay. in, in additional money, but typically no. Mm -hmm. Well, if there's any like young filmmaker in here, now you, you know how to do it. <laughs> um, it seems a very personal film, uh, and I'm sure people ask you a question about autobiographical ideas. Um, you know, it's not a, your life documentary, but it seems very personal. Is that something that is difficult for you or motivating or to just write about and direct? Or? Well, it's, it's something I've been thinking about since I was uh, 19 or 20. The, the funeral that's depicted in this film was the event that you know, kind of caused me to want to make a movie about my family. But because I have, I, you know, there, it, it had been with me for so long, um, I didn't think it would be my second feature. It always seemed like something you would make later on, reflecting back, you know. I didn't think I'd be making it at the age of 34. But the, the wonderful thing about having... Um, a father who recorded everything growing up is that I had this great archive of stuff and I had many family photos and of course the memories that I could select from um, you know the, there, there was a lot of stuff in my head there was a lot of archival material or reference material uh, that allowed me to uh, pretty seamlessly put the film together in some form. Um, so archive that we see in the film it's things you find Everything you find, you didn't create anything. That's right. Even the Liberty piece at the beginning? Even the Liberty coin. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't yes. sure about that one. Yeah. Um, how did you do the research um, in, in, for that part? Um, well, when I wrote the script, there were two outlines, or there were two timelines. One was my family history, or beginning in 1985, which was when my father's brother died of AIDS, uh, and ending in 2006 when I went off to college. And I, I created a chronology of things that I remembered, some of which show up in this film. And then parallel to that, there was a, uh, call it the historical political timeline of things that um, I, have, I had very dim memories of, and then as I got older, became very um, formative to me. The election of uh, Bush in 04, the re-election of Bush in 04, but also going back to the World Trade Center bombing. So there, there was this other timeline running mm -hmm. and finding a way to interlace these things um, not just to give a sense of the times, but uh, that fit in with the sense impressions of the child you see throughout the film, the, the shots of the light on the wall, the shots of the, the, the light on the, on the carpeting. It is all very subjective. I mean, it, it does um, have a, a kind of ghostly uh, effect if it's taken out of context. I mean, I, you know, I didn't want to make something that just editorialized the times, you know, then this happened, this happened, this happened. I mean, you know, the Bill Clinton impeachment was a big thing for me as a kid, but I didn't show that. I mean, the O.J. Simpson, you know, Bronco chase, you know, those, were, those weren't things that I thought were as interesting visually. Uh, and then the Getty Archive had all of their stuff digitized. It's all on YouTube, and you could go through their library, and then, you know, the Getty Archive is very, very expensive. I think they were, it was something like $80 a second which was outrageous, and we found, a, um, we found an archive house that had comparable footage in New York City for half the price, but from different news cameras. So it was the same, same events, but different, uh, different footage of it. So when you were writing, um, you were writing some sort of uh, narrative, 
with Jesse's life, different points. And then when you were like shooting, when did you decide to insert the archive that you just mentioned? Well, the uh, film before, or, or the script, before it mm -hmm. actually became a script, was a series of uh, index cards that were arranged on the wall of my apartment. And then that became a, a chart, a spreadsheet. And figuring out through this spreadsheet and through this chart how to introduce the historical material and being able to figure out a way to juxtapose the, the material that was shot or that would be shot, the stuff from the world of the film with all of the um, historical material. It's really a matter of shuffling things around. And then when editing, also figuring out how to, uh, you know, the, there were, there was a, I mean, there was some archival material that we didn't end up using. There was a television commercial from Bush's re-election campaign that didn't get used. Um, but by and large, the stuff in the film is what was um, planned. Uh, can we talk about the, all the Jesses? Um, you know, like there's three, four? Uh, there are four. Four, okay. Yes. Thanks to the casting directors, mm -hmm. uh, Daryl Eisenberg and Ali Beans. Daryl is here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where she is, but. Yeah. So, can you, okay, can you talk about uh, finding each of them? Mm -hmm. um, I assume you wanted the physical resemblance, but there was probably more than that. Uh, well, physical resemblance between the kids. Um, the, interestingly, the, every, the, Brian Darcy James, who plays Richard, and Monica Barbaro, who plays Lydia, they do have a passing resemblance to my parents. They actually look like my parents quite a bit, and they were, they were done up like that. But the son, you know, I, it became a matter of trying to have continuity between the different performers so that the audience wasn't jarred. And we, we figured, or it, I, I think Daryl and Allie had kind of pointed out, having a, you know, when you have a redhead or someone who doesn't resemble physically the dark, dark haired family. So he's always being singled out. Uh, but I, I think the kids, the, the four Jessies, they, they work pretty seamlessly on screen. Uh, I think it was a matter of luck that we kind of looked at the auditions and then figured out how to how to pair them. Uh, because we also had that issue with another character, uh, uh, Christine Orkin, who is Lydia's youngest sister, who we see in like the first in the end of the film and early on in the film as a as a like an adult young adolescent and then uh, a transition to another actress who plays her at an older age. They're both here as well. So <laughs> Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about working with, uh, with, with a child actor and then like the, the teenage and, uh, mm. and older Jesse? I think the kids all, they were, uh, you know, they, they were really, I was very worried dealing with kids because I'm not used to it. I'm not used to being around children. I don't really like them very much. Um, but maybe that's the benefit of having parents who are very focused on trying to have their kids have I'm talking mainly for about the boys, the Jessies. I mean, the, the youngest who was, I, I think, pretty cooperative. I don't know if the hair and makeup and costume people would agree, but you know, he, he, they, they were you know, well-behaved and they, they knew what they needed to do. And there was really, uh, also it was kind of impressive because we had to work so quickly. Uh, I think we shot with the actors, if I'm remembering, it's been a while, 19 or 20 days. And there are all kinds of child labor laws in New York State that have to be observed, and you know they needed to be homeschooled, or they had to do remote learning. And despite all that, they all, you know, they all were pretty terrific, I think. Um, what's really important in the film? It's the look of the film, uh, which goes also like the, uh, the way it's shot, uh, and also the aesthetic overall, uh, the art and makeup as well, and. There's never like um, a sense of like the past being fake. It doesn't look really strong. It's very subtle, but it looks very real. Uh, can you talk about creating this? <laughs> um, if anyone were to look through my <laughs> my family's photographs from the late 80s, 
it would be kind of a stereotype. I mean, there, there, there was the, you know, the very big hair, the shoulder pads, the things that are very clear markers of the time that I didn't, you know, I didn't want to make this movie about nostalgia necessarily. I didn't want to make it a movie that's the kind of greatest hits of Reagan era fashion. I think it was always important that the fact that, you know, the fact that they're named Damrosh and they don't have a very Italian American sounding name, that those things would be kind of put back to the, push back a bit because I, did, I also thought there's a tendency to use those things and caricature them. Uh, but that being said, all of the photographs I had in the home movies, they did serve as references. They did serve as kind of research material. Mm -hmm. Not the most garish stuff necessarily, but my parents, I feel very fortunate to have my, my parents' wedding documented. Uh, you know, I can see the wedding dress my mother had, the way the hair was permed, the, the bridesmaids' dresses. Uh, so it, it was a matter of, uh, when possible, trying to copy the things that I thought would give a sense of the times without uh, kind of really underlining it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also when we couldn't find replicas of certain costumes or something, we, we would uh, find you know, things that look similar or that weren't similar at all, but that gave you an impression of the decade. And can you talk about uh, the cinematography also? <laughs> uh, the, the DP on the film, uh, his name is Barton Courtright, and this is the uh, this is the fourth film we've worked on together. He he shot my first feature, Notes on an Appearance, and uh, visually there are things that I just continue to do from film to film to film. It wasn't necessarily a matter of trying something very different from what I've done. I mean, I, one thing I did do differently on this film was use a, a zoom lens throughout the entire film, and I. I not that there's, there are zoom shots throughout the entire film, they're placed in very specific spots, but these zoom lens stayed on the camera throughout the whole shoot, even when we weren't doing zooms. And, you know, a DP would probably say that we should use prime lenses instead of a zoom lens for shots that are still and that, that don't require a zoom. Uh, but because of how quickly we had to work, if we had to reframe something, uh, and there was a, quite a bit of this, uh, we would have to like take the 35 millimeter lens off the camera, put a 50 millimeter lens on, move the camera seat. So having the zoom lens allowed us to just reframe very easily uh, without having to, you know, to waste time with different camera setups. But the way I tend to frame things is I, um, and one advantage of shooting in my childhood home where my father still lives is that when I was writing, I knew how things would be framed. And, uh, Typically, when I work with Bart, I frame the shots you know, with my phone and take a picture, and then he lights it and you know, copies the frame and lights it. And that's, um, that's how we worked on this. But it's the first time you use Zoom? Really? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you probably you would know better than me. <laughs> um, uh, I have one last question, and then I think we can open it up to the audience. Um, uh, what I find also super interesting in the film and very striking, it's the way every information is being delivered and the way Jesse is the center character, but then he's also extremely passive and it's just what comes to him. And as a viewer, uh, you, you get thrown into like being Jesse and how will you react? Uh, but I really love the way you deliver the information uh, you know, from the opening scene about the, uh, the death of the uncle uh, and all the secrets and all the arguments and, and the violent, sort of violence also, which is off screen, but you don't, you know, you get thrown into being Jesse, really. Well, I, you know, the voice, the, the, the function of the narrator in this film is really important in terms of not only conveying a lot of information, admittedly, there are a number of people who you have to remember and have to remember their relationship to one another and who is the in-law of who and the sister of who and so on. So yes, the narrator does that. Then also the narrator in a way, not that the narrator describes what Jesse is thinking and feeling at any time, but it has some insight I think into, you know, Jesse's, the, the kind of family history that he's observing. But having a third person narrator was very important from the very beginning because I thought that, uh, one, because the material is so personal that I didn't want to run the risk of sentimentalizing 
uh, and I didn't want to make some kind of you know melodrama in which the viewer is so implicated in what goes on and has a point of identification with the character. The, the narrator creates a frame, I think, and it's important that the narrator has no connection to the world of the film. I mean, it's almost kind of business-like, the narration. Uh, I mean, one of the, oddly, one of the, one of the films I was um, thinking about a lot when I wrote the script and when I was writing the narration was Barry Lyndon. Uh, I mean, there's, there's that way of trying to use a narrator to chronicle a rise and fall in this case, of a, of a family. Yes. Uh, we can take some audience question. Hi, thank you so much. It was uh, very interesting. Um, I have a question. When, when you work um, autobiographically like this, do you censor yourself in a way because you know the people so well and you think about how they'll respond? And... How did they respond? Was it was the question about um, factoring in the response of the people who are depicted in it? Yeah, like is that. Yeah, yes. I mean, it was. Uh, you know, I never. Uh, oddly, I never thought I would. They would have to see it. <laughs> <laughs> they did see it, um, and I think they were very moved by it. They knew that I had been making. You know, they knew what this movie was going to be. In fact, um, in October. My mother appears in this film as an extra during the wedding scene, uh, which was very strange for her to see actors recreate her wedding to her ex-husband. Uh, but she, uh, her, you know, she said, "I want to have a private screening for me and for the friends of mine who were extras in this film. Can we do that?" And I said, "That's fine. You can do that." But then it became like, you know, she sent out 40 invitations to everyone. She invited her ex-husband. She invited my, her ex-husband's in-laws. Uh, so, of course, I was invited to this thing. They had a cake, kind of like, you know, the graduation party. <laughs> and I said that I had COVID. So I didn't go. They had a wonderful time without me. Uh, and uh, I spoke to them after, and they were, you know, they, I think they were touched. I think, you know, my father <laughs> went up to my cousin and said, I didn't realize I had such an effect on Ricky's life. I said, well, <laughs> when you're a parent, you know, it's part of... But yes, they, they dealt with it in their own time, in their own way, uh, you know, better than a venue like this, I think, where you're just, you know, I think would be less appropriate. So I'm glad they were able to see it. But they, yeah, they were, I think they were very touched. What did they appreciate the artistic skills you put into the film other than the autobiographical? Well, my family is mainly, they're not, I mean, they don't, they don't really watch movies. They're not, the things they do watch aren't necessarily things that I think that they would, you know, they, they would not, respond to this unless they knew that they were being okay. depicted in it. So there was that incentive for them. They were really curious about, you know, what, you know, I think they thought that it was gonna be much worse than it actually was. So there was a kind of, you know, relief. There are all kinds of things. If I really wanted to make the movie I thought I was gonna make when I was a teenager, you know, it could be really vindictive, but I didn't, so. So maybe now we're gonna see more art movies, thanks to you. What's that? Oh yes, no, I don't know about that. Barry Lyndon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. There's someone there. Okay, my my question is quite short. Uh, I'm wondering why why this title? If you can talk a bit about uh, the cathedral. Oh, okay. thank you. The title. Um, I mean, I wish I had, uh, I, I, I wish I had something more thoughtful to say right now. Other than that, it is uh, the when he's looking through the book of cathedral drawings. I'm trying to remember the name of the guy who published a series of children's books on different topics. But there is this book, the cathedral, about the construction of cathedrals, and he's looking at it. I don't know if it's very clear in the in uh, in, in the film, but uh, he is overhearing his mother in the master bedroom and she comes out and she's crying. It's kind of his first uh, awareness that there is something going on in his parents' relationship that may not be good. Linking that, you know, linking the, the, the image of a cathedral with this dawning moment uh, or this realization in the kid's life 
it seemed, um, and I, you know, when I was a kid, I had a fascination. I was really, I, I really liked cathedrals, um, and I, it just seemed like I, to name a movie, um, to give it a title that doesn't have a direct reference to, to the content of it seemed like, I mean, the way I tend to like to title my films. Um, I mean, I made a short film called Spiral Jetty, which has nothing to do with Robert Smithson or, or the piece Spiral Jetty. Uh, there was a question in the back, too. I had a feeling of uh, estrangement the first uh, maybe 20 minutes or so. You have these almost static shots and you and a kind of montage between them. I mean, a shot, something happens, people do something, but it seems very static, it seemed very cool. And that was my reaction the first maybe 20 minutes or so. And then slowly a kind of narrative so, uh, could you comment on that? Is that uh... on on the the decision to use a a, a very still camera? And... Yeah, and am I right to, to have this responsive uh, sense of restraint? I think so. Um, I think you're. I mean, I think you're right. It's part of the design of the film in a way. When I was organizing this film, and when I was thinking about it, or when I was writing it, I'm going back to this idea of a grid or a chart, which is really very crucial to me in the planning to figure out how certain images are juxtaposed, but also because it's not a three-act film, there are like eight or nine columns representing different sections of the film. And if I'm looking at one column and there's an image of a close-up of a hand, how does that correspond to the close-up of a hand at the end when he's waking up with a panic attack? So um, in just visualizing all these things, it was clear to me that they were going to be still images, fixed cameras. Um, and then the, you know, the, the zooms being the one time that that's broken. But uh, moving the camera to me seems, I didn't, I didn't find it, I just didn't find a purpose for it in this film. I mean, I, besides you know, using a zoom lens, which changes the scale of the shots, I didn't, it didn't seem, uh, maybe this goes back to having studied all these still photos. I mean, a lot of what you see in the film, the arrangements of the people in the frame, in fact, the very first image in the film is a photograph of my family, which is recreated later on in the film, uh, kind of a picnic before the father and the father-in-law have a fight. Uh, studying these pictures and having these still images at my disposal where I'm arranging people in tableaus, you know, uh, it just seemed having the still camera was a way to be faithful to that. So. Well, it's an aesthetic that uh, really suits your film and that you've used before, but maybe not to that extent. Um, yeah. uh, I think it was also... Uh, I, also questions? Um, I guess my question more broadly is, do you have faith in the family as um, like a unit of social organization kind of moving forward in this specific way that it's organized on screen? And I guess um, I'm answering my own question in saying no, <laughs> because um, you know some of the events even that we're keeping the family together in the film. Um, you know, your use of like the tableaus and the still shots showing that the event itself is kind of keeping the family together somehow. Um, it, everything feels very empty. But at the, at, and while I see this critique in the film, the end of the film ends on this sort of happy note where the family is reunited together again. So I'm wondering, yeah, just more broadly, your thoughts on the family. Thank you. Well, I mean, I could only speak to my opinions of my own family, uh, you know, which kind of dissembled and disintegrated in different ways. What, you know, what this film doesn't show is that my mother and father are on very, I mean, they're like good friends. They talk every day almost. My grandmother, who has, Flora Orkin in this film, who has the, the, the kind of failed reconciliation with her sister at their mother's funeral, they reconciled years later. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I have, it, it's limited in time. It's limited to a period in my life that resonates with me. The, you know, the, the, the bit about, um, 
the ending being, I, I don't remember if you used the word happy. I mean, I, I think of it as kind of a sad ending. I, I don't think, uh, yes, they're together, but some of those people are, we know are no longer alive. Some of them will, you know, they're, or they're all at some point be gone. Um, and telling telling Jesse to come say goodbye isn't just, of course, saying goodbye to them as they're leaving the apartment, but it's kind of a farewell to a whole moment in the kid's life. So I do think there is something in, that touches on something the narrator says, you know, being an only child or being raised an only child without siblings. I have a half-brother, but my mother and father never had another child. And you think about your family aging, you think about your parents no longer being alive, and the consequences that has on a kid who doesn't have shared memories with a sibling. Uh, and I think that kind of, that ending, you know, he's looking out the window and he goes off. I think it touches on that in some way. Um, do you, oh, there's someone here. Yeah. It starts with the uncle who dies of AIDS, and, and there's sort of funny and ironic and also obviously very painful denial that the family has. And I'm wondering, I mean, because you start with that, and it's sort of, you know, it's jarring, you feel as if it set you up for the family always not really saying the truth of things of what was happening. And I'm wondering, I mean, and it also starts, you know, you sort of assume that the uncle was gay, and... and you're sort of wondering, I think, all the way through the film, if the main character, if that's part of his alienation from his family, or how that, you know, how they reconciled, or how they ever spoke about the uncle again, or maybe, you know, and, and I'm not making comments about you, but whatever this character, it, you, it, it gave me that feeling. At least. So I'm wondering, it's, it's a very strong sort of joke at the, at the beginning, which um, was good. I mean, I enjoyed it, but I also felt it, it like kind of like, like oh, what, and what's this movie about, and the, the way it unfolded, and, and sort of the family lie about this uncle who died, which right. must have been upsetting to everyone else. It's the family's founding myth. I mean, it's the thing that, the, the, the myth about the cause of the guy, you know, the uncle's death, the thing that gets, you know, brushed under the carpet or, or answered to very evasively. But there's also a fear, I think, of an untimely death. I think... It isn't a coincidence that one of the last things we see in the film is a close-up of Jesse's hand, the older Jesse, on the bed, which in my mind was a way of creating connection, thematically at least, between the uncle he never meets, mm -hmm. who dies before his time is up, and the son who, you know, uh, is, you know, a kid, but perhaps there are similar fears, this fear of, you know, being, you know, uh, having, having the clock run out uh, prematurely. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I don't mean to mention or summons her, but the quote, we all tell our sto self stories in order to live is uh, part of what families, I don't know, my family does. And if by stories we mean fiction, then yes, I mean, there's, not that all stories have to be equated with lying, but uh, there is something that's necessary for them, the family, in, uh, in those evasions, I think. I see. Okay. Well, I wanted to know what you wanted to do next um, after this film, not just because this one is, I mean, that was a special production because it was like commissioned and you had a different type of budget, but maybe it also brought you to like uh, bigger festivals, you know, like maybe more, more name recognition and maybe more open doors. I think you have a, such a different aesthetic from anything else we, we, we see in cinema that maybe you can, you can make a, you know, more bigger films. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm so used to making movies for very little money that to have been given about $200,000 to make this was like, you know, I mean, my first feature cost 30,000. Uh, so if someone were to give me a million or something, to me that would be like, I mean, I can make mo three movies or something with that, but. Uh, that sounds but, good. Uh, I, I'm not. 
I have been saying as a joke really for the past few years with Graham, who unfortunately is not here, the, the producer on the film, that I, you know, I, I want to make a movie one day about um, the Clinton White House. It would feature the Clinton's cat, Socks. <laughs> uh, but that's all, that's all I'll say. For no, but you, you might, you might make, uh, be a bigger budget <laughs> if you have Perhaps. animals I mean, and a everything. A cat wrangler. You know? yeah. so <laughs> they may want to be paid. <laughs> you have to feed the cat, you know, so, so many things. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank, uh, you. thank you for showing the film. Uh, <laughs> thank you for us. <laughs>